We're in Philippians chapter number two, and we're going to just focus on two verses uh, here this, uh, this morning. I want you to see them with me. Verse number 12. The Bible says there, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now that sounds a little odd to us, doesn't it? I've read that verse many times, and it sounds a little strange. That's not what we believe, is it? That we're to work out our own salvation? Maybe we should read that verse again. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The title of the message this morning is Work at It. Work at It. Father, we pray that you would help us this morning as we dive into a very unusual passage of Scripture. On the surface, it sounds like something that we don't believe, and yet we claim to be Bible believers. Uh, We would say that if it's in this book, we believe it, and if it's not in this book, then there would be some element of Christian liberty in which someone could do what they feel is right and what is best according to their conscience, and yet we come to a text and a passage, a verse that has the sound of a works-based salvation. Give us understanding in these things this morning, we pray. I pray, first and foremost, that if there is someone here today that has never been saved, Lord, that they would trust Christ as their Savior. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, for those that are here today that are saved, uh, Lord, in which they maybe have grown a little bit lazy and a little bit complacent, uh, Lord, um, uh, lethargic in their spiritual walk and in their journey, I pray, Lord, that you would do a great work in their lives. Thank you for what we've already experienced this morning. Help us today, Lord, as we, as we enter into this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there are a great many things in life that are just plain hard work. I'm thinking of things like marriage and child rearing and pastoring and living in the, living the Christian life. I, I, I think to myself of some of the things that you folks have to do day in and day out, going into a workplace. Maybe you're involved in manufacturing or maybe you're involved in sales or you're involved in business or finances or whatever the case might be. And, uh, and you just have to admit that, uh, that, that it's hard work what you've been given to do. I'm thinking of, again, these couples that we've rep- re- recognized this morning, 66 and 69 years of marriage, that doesn't just happen. Uh, that requires some hard work and some effort and some dedication, perhaps on some very difficult and challenging days. I want you to know that work, according to the Bible, work is not a result of the curse of sin. In fact, the Bible says in Genesis chapter number two, before, uh, before sin had ever entered into this world, the Bible says that the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So before sin even enters into our world in Genesis chapter three, Adam's placed in the garden and he's given a job to do. But here's what we discover. We discover that while work is not the result of the curse of sin, hard work is. The Bible says in Genesis chapter number three, after mankind had sinned, here's part of the curse that God placed upon this earth and upon man. He says, and unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. As a result of the curse of sin, you understand, right, that that every job that you're given to do is naturally going to resist you. It's going to work against you. For instance, I share with this at 930 this morning that, uh, you know, I can, I can in the springtime, I can go to the local Home Depot or some local garden store and I could invest some money into buying plants for my home. I did this last year. It was the biggest waste of money that I've ever spent. A part of it is I I planted it too early. Part of it is I have no idea what I'm doing. And part of it is I really just don't care, to be very honest with you. But I went, my my daughter is into this sort of thing, and she sort of bugged me a little bit about it. And so we went and we spent some pretty good money on buying some plants that we could plant in our in in our yard. And we went home and we dug those things. We probably planted them in the wrong place. We planted them too early. Like I said, I have no idea what I'm doing. And here's what I find: I find I spent money on these things. And I even, pla- I even planted them the way that I, was, I thought I was supposed to, and I even watered them and made sure that they got ac- adequate water. And do you know within about a month or two, those things were dead as a doornail. 
Now here's, here's, what, here's what is really troubling to me. In, in their place were weeds. I mean, weeds that were growing and abounding with life and, I, I mean, out of control. And, and I'm thinking to myself, how is this possible? How is it possible that I could go and I could spend money? If I would have, if I would have thought about that, if I knew the weeds were going to come up, I could have saved myself all of that money. I mean, who needs, who needs to go spend money and get down on your knees and dig in the earth and plant flowers when you're going to get something coming out of there anyways? You understand, you understand the curse of sin is that, listen, it takes the jobs that we were going to have to do regardless, and it makes them that much harder. So in other words, work is not the result of the curse of sin. You were going to have to work no matter what. Adam was placed in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it, to make it look nice, and maybe to keep things trimmed and, and to pluck some things that needed to be plucked and maybe even to plant some additional things that needed to be planted. All of that Adam was going to have to do. But after the curse of sin, God said, okay, here's what's going to happen now. Now you're still going to have to do that, but the earth is going to actively oppose you. It's going to resist the work that you're trying to do. That's not just true. That's not just true in the earth. That's true in every element of work. You know, I love these. I love these YouTube videos that tell you, you know, okay, you need to fix this in your house. This should take about an hour. Yeah, maybe an hour for the guy doing the video. For me, it's going to take at least a month, maybe even longer, if it ever happens. Why? Because I get into a project and start tearing things apart and, 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 and then I find I, I don't have this tool and, and I need this tool and then I find I don't have this part and then I discover it's not the thing that I needed to fix in the first place, that something else is wrong and I go to the store and I buy the part and it's the wrong part and I'm running back and forth and back and forth to the point where I'm sitting here saying, why do I even bother with it all to begin with? I'm just simply saying, listen, living in this world, dealing with hard work should be a fairly normal thing for us. Now, as we come to this text and this verse, we're led, we're led to, to, to read this and to think that maybe, maybe there's a, a case to be made for a works-based salvation. It sort of sounds like it, doesn't it? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, if you're, going to, if you're going to be saved, you're going to have to work at it. And you're going to have to put some effort into it. And I don't know about you, but when I read that verse, I sort of have to scratch my head a little bit. And I have to think, you know, that's not what I've been taught. I, I don't think that's what the rest of the Bible says, but that sure is what it sounds like, isn't it? That in order to be saved, you and I, we're going to have to put a lot of hard work and a lot of effort into it. I think what we need to do is we need to consider the, the totality of the Bible. What does it say in other places? And the truth of the matter is we don't even have to wander away from the man who is humanly the author of this text to discover that Paul, Paul wrote some other things that would seem to indicate that what he's saying here is not what we think he's saying here. For instance, he would write in Romans chapter 6 and verse number 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, so in Philippians 2.12, it sounds like he's saying that salvation is a work. It's something that you have to work at and, and put effort towards. And yet when we come to Romans 6.23, he says that the, it, that the salvation is a gift of God. And that it comes through faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. I, I mean, that's, that's what it says in Romans 6.23. In Galatians 2 and verse number 21, he writes these words. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness or salvation come by the law or come by works, doing things that the law tells me to do, if that's how we get saved, then Christ is dead in vain. So the same author is writing in, 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 in Romans 6.23 that, 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 that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. It's a gift. Salvation is a gift. He writes in Galatians 2.21 that, that it comes about as a result of the grace of God. And, and, and through the death of Christ, and that if you could work for it and if you could earn it, then Jesus Christ would never have had to die. He goes on to say, in, in, same author, same author that wrote Philippians 2.12, our text, he wrote in Ephesians 2.8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. Well, well it's, it sounds like if, 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 if we read Philippians 2.12 and it sounds the way we think it sounds, then he should have written here, for by grace are you saved through works, but that's not what he writes. He says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, there it is, not of works, 
lest any man should boast. He says in Titus, same, same author, Titus chapter three and verse number five, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now, now here's the question I wanna propose. Why would Paul contradict himself here? Is he contradicting himself? Is he really saying in Philippians 2.12 that you have to, in order to be saved, you gotta work on it? That you've gotta do something of your own strength and of your own power and of your own ability. I think it's pretty obvious, isn't it, that the evidence points to the fact that Paul is not arguing for or embracing a works-based salvation based on the fact that over and over and over and over again, he reveals to us that salvation is a free gift. He reveals to us that salvation is by grace through faith. It's connected to what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. In other words, the only person that had to work at your salvation was Jesus. And he did all of the work that was necessary. He came to this earth and he lived a sinless life and he suffered and he bled and he died on an old rugged cross. He was buried and he rose again that you and I might be saved. If there's a work that is necessary to be saved, guess what? It's already been accomplished in the person and the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. I mean, the the totality of the Bible reveals that to be abundantly clear that salvation is not of works, but it is a gift. It is by grace through faith. So then then we, we have to ask ourselves, well, what exactly then are you referencing? Because we're preaching through this book. We can't skip over this verse. I have to tell you, at the beginning of the week, I thought, I wonder if they would remember if we just skipped over this verse. Because this is sort of challenging, right? I mean, this is a little confusing There's a danger that someone might come in and read that verse and hear that and think to themselves, well, I I guess I I probably do need to put some work into being saved. What is he he saying? I, I believe, again, based on study and based on these other texts, that it seems to me to be pretty obvious that Paul is not teaching that we must work for our salvation, but that we must work at our salvation. Let me try to explain or illustrate that. Imagine you went home this afternoon and someone called you on the phone. And they said, hey, I have good news for you. I own a plot of land in some place, and, and, and I am, I am, I, I've written your name on the title deed. The land is yours. You own it now. You didn't have to buy it. You didn't have to earn it. I'm doing it because I have a close relationship with you, because I love you, and I just want to be a blessing to you. And you think, well, that's nice. And then that person took it a step further and they said, now listen, I I understand land is land and and there's a value there, no no doubt about it, but but I also want you to know that this land is not like any other land. In fact, in fact, buried underneath this land is 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 a treasure store of natural resources. It may be, it may be they tell you that underneath this land, we believe that there's gold to be mined underneath this land. It could be, it could be to say, you know, underneath this land is, is, is oil. Hundreds of millions of barrels of oil is underneath there. That, that's available. And I'm telling you, once you start pumping the oil out of here, you're going to be a very wealthy and a very rich individual. Or it may be, it may be he tells you there's natural gas buried underneath this land. And if you'll call this company, they'll come in and they'll begin to, and they'll be able to extract natural gas and you'll be a very, potentially be a very wealthy individual. Now you understand the land has been given to you and you're, you're thankful for that, but you understand that, listen, buried underneath that land, buried underneath that ground are some incredible, incredible natural resources that if you could extract those things from underneath, the, if you could unearth those things, boy, you'd be very wealthy, you'd be very rich. Therefore, it becomes incumbent upon you to not just sit on that land and to say, oh, thank you, But to actually go there, perhaps to take a a shovel or two and to begin to dig in the earth and to begin to turn over the ground and to begin to search and to look, where is the gold? Can we bring someone in who can bring the oil up from underneath the surface so that we can begin to allow this land to work for us and and, and to be an advantage or to be a blessing to us? But understand this, listen, in order to get to the product, there's gonna have to be some really hard work that's put into it. So what does it mean? Does that, how does that illustrate this concept in which Paul writes, work out your own salvation? What exactly, what exactly are we working out or at? What are the, we might ask this question, what are the natural resources of the Christian life? 
I believe we find them in our Bible. I'm talking about the essence of the Christian life. I'm talking about the very treasure of our salvation. We know, we know we have eternal life, yes, but what else does God give us? What is maybe buried underneath the surface that he is saying, listen, if you'll work at it a little bit, you can, you can pull some things out of, the, out of the Christian life, out of the word of God, out of the Holy Spirit of God that will be incredibly valuable and helpful to you. I want you to hold your place in Philippians chapter two and I want you to go with me to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, look in verse number 13. I believe that this passage and another one I'm gonna show you in a minute reveal to us the natural resources, the great value of the Christian life. Who he says in verse number 13 of 1 Corinthians 13. And now abideth, that's a key word. Uh, that means it's here to stay. This is what you have. This is who you are in Christ. This is what the word of God gives us. This is the Christian life, the essence of the Christian life. And now abideth what? Faith, hope, charity. These three. These three, listen, I believe these three are the, the abiding essence of the Christian life. These, these three, I believe, are the are the, the treasures that are buried underneath the surface. When you got saved, likely you weren't given a whole lot of thought to the idea of, of how you can show more love and how you could grow in faith. You just simply heard, I'm a sinner, and, 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 and because of my sin, I have to die and go to hell, and yet Jesus Christ paid the penalty for my sin, and all I have to do is just repent of my sin and confess him to be Lord and Savior in my life and invite him into my life and, and have a change of, of heart, a change of direction, and I can be saved. And you, you just simply did that, not realizing that not only were you getting eternal life in Jesus Christ, a home in heaven forevermore, but you were getting faith and hope and charity, these three, and that they will abide throughout your life. Hold your place still in Philippians 2 and go to 1 Thessalonians 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we find these three, these three essences, these three natural resources of the Christian life are found in this text as well. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 3. He says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. There it is, faith. Your work of faith. And your labor of love. There, there it is. It's, it's charity in 1 Corinthians 13. Here it's, it's translated love, but it's the same thing. He says, he says, church at Thessalonica, I remember without ceasing your work of faith. I remember your labor of love. I remember your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. Do you see it? The three abiding virtues, the three abiding essences of the Christian life are these, faith, hope, and love or charity. These, listen, these are the great treasures, we might say. These are the natural resources of the divine nature given to us at our salvation. And Paul is writing here in Philippians chapter number two, and he's saying, listen, if you're going to benefit from these things, if these things are gonna be a blessing to you as well as to others, you're gonna have to dig real deep. You're gonna have to work real hard uh, to, to grow in your faith and to live in hope and to show love. These are the things that you're gonna to have to give effort towards. Sometimes in our Christian life, it's easy to get a little bit lazy, isn't it? I'm saved, so I go to church, and that's about, that's about as good as it's gonna get. Well, I, I, I come, I might even put some money in the offering plate, but I'm not really, I'm not really developing in my Christian life. I'm not really growing. You know, I believe the spiritual mirrors the physical. In other words, when someone gets saved, the Bible says they become like a newborn baby in Christ. And here's the, here's the danger, because this happens sometimes in our adult lives as well. We can reach a point in life as adults in which we're not really striving to go any further. Man, I've, I've reached pretty much probably what I think to be the pinnacle of my career. Therefore, I don't, need to, I don't need to do too much more studying. I don't need to do too much more working. I don't need to do too much more growth. Or At this point, all I'm looking forward to is retirement. I want to get to retirement. I want to get to a place where I'm retired and I've got good money stored up so that we can live a pretty comfortable life in retirement. And that's all that I'm thinking about. And you know what I find? I find sometimes the longer we're saved, we sort of get that same mindset. We get to a point where we think, I'm just, I'm just thinking about retirement. I'm, just, I'm not really growing anymore. I'm not really developing anymore. 
I'm not really, really working anymore towards developing as an individual and growing in these areas. That's not something I'm really all that passionate about. And Paul takes pen in hand and he writes, he, he writes these words. He says, listen, you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And there's, listen, there's no expiration date to this command. We can't say, well, yeah, but he probably was writing to a bunch of, you know, really, really young people, and I'm a little bit older. Or I've been saved a little bit longer. This isn't for me. Listen, unless the Bible clearly says it's not for you, then it's for you, and it's for me. So as we consider the three virtues, the three, the three abiding resources of the Christian life, they are faith and their hope and their love. What exactly is our responsibility? What are we, to be, what are we to working at in these areas? Number one, I would say, By way of introduction, work at growing your faith. Work at growing your faith. In Luke chapter 17 and verse number five, Jesus had just given a very, very hard saying to the apostles. The saying was was in in line with with forgiveness. And here's what he said. He said, he said, if someone sins against you seven times in one day, and they come to you seven separate times, and they, they apologize, and they show evidence that they're repentant, he says, he says, then seven times over, you need to forgive them. You know what the apostles did? They looked at Jesus, and they said, Lord, increase our faith. You know what they were saying? They are saying, Lord, this is a really hard saying. I, I, I can't do this. I can't have someone sin against me, same person sin against me seven times in a day, and seven times in a day they come and they ask for forgiveness, and me, I I mean, I can maybe say the words, but I'm not gonna mean it in my heart. Lord, if if I'm gonna get to this point, Lord, you're going to have to increase my faith. In other words, I'm gonna have to grow to this point. Can I just tell you that, can I just tell you that that if if, if you're looking at your life today and say, you know, I'm not really, I'm not really all that far, I'm not really all that far away and grow from, from when I was saved to where I am today. You look back at those days and they were good days, they were wonderful days, but, but, but you've not seen a whole lot of growth since, since then. That's problematic. That's not how God designed the Christian life to be lived. Some of you, no doubt, you can look back over your life and you can say, man, when I first got saved, I remember the very first faith promise commitment form I filled out. I remember writing 50 cents on there. And now, now today I'm giving 50 bucks a week, 50 bucks a month, You know, whatever the case might be. And you you can see evidence of how your faith has grown. Say, man, when I first got saved, if someone would have come up to me and they would have sinned against me, man, I would have have looked for a way that I could get back at them. I would have looked for a way to sin against them. But today, I'm not like that anymore. Today, I I, I try to give grace. And if they come to me and if they repent, boy, I'm, I'm, I'm ready and I'm willing to forgive and to try to restore the relationship, to find reconciliation. And you say, but man, that's not who I was back then, but that's who I am now. Why? Because the faith has grown in your life. Lord, increase our faith. It's likely, it's likely that we may need, to pray, may need to be praying a similar prayer. Because I just got to tell you, there's, there's lots of hard sayings in this book. There's a lot of things in this book that when I come to them, I'm like the apostles, I can't do that. What I need to say is not focus on what I can't do. What I need to pray, what I need to focus on is, Lord, increase my faith so that you can bring me to the point where I can do that. You need to work. What do I need to work out my own salvation? What do you mean work at it? Work at growing your faith. Number two, work at living in hope. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 3, the Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You know what he says? He says, he says that our hope is a lively hope. You know what that means? That means it's a living hope. In other words, my hope is sort of breathing, right? It's not sort of breathing. It is breathing. My hope, my hope has legs. My hope has eyes that can see. My hope has ears that can hear. You say, well, what is your hope? My hope is Jesus. My hope is the fact that Jesus Christ came out of the grave, that he is alive today. My hope is a living hope. Therefore, therefore, I need to work. I need to work at being reminded that my hope is alive, that I have a living hope, and that I need to live in that hope. For, for instance, you, you, may, you, may, you may find yourself in the next year staring down a trial like Brother Paul shared with us earlier today. That doctor says, hey, you've got this, and it's not good, and Here's what we think we can do, but we can't make any promises. And it is only natural in that moment, probably to be filled with fear, to be a little scared, certainly to look at your family and to see them overwhelmed with fear. 
That's natural and that's normal and I, I, I don't begrudge anybody for doing that. But listen, listen, you need to replace that as soon as possible with this thought and this idea. Listen, this is not the end of, this is not the end of everything. Why? Because Jesus Christ came out of the grave. Therefore, my hope is alive. In other words, his resurrection is the, is the prototype. It's the template for me. And you can put me in the ground someday. And maybe I'll be there a little bit longer than three days and three nights like he was. But I know one of these days the trumpet is sounding and I'm going to rise from the dead and I'm going to walk in newness of life. No doubt about it. That is my hope. Therefore, therefore, no matter what we're dealing with, and we're dealing with some crazy things in this world, I don't have to be overwhelmed and overrun with fear. I don't have to be cowering in a corner somewhere. I can, I, I can lift my head up and I can say, hold on a minute. I, I know there's some bad things that are happening and I know there's lots of fear and there's lots of concern about the future, but wait a minute. We have a living hope. It's Jesus Christ. And this earth is not all there is to it. See, too many Christians are living for this world and its pleasures. And when life treats them poorly, and it will, and there's a, in those moments, there's a struggle, isn't there, for joy and for purpose and for meaning. But working out my own salvation, it features a purpose determination to live in the hope of Christ's resurrection, which keeps me encouraged, listen, even on my worst days. The Bible says in Romans 15, 13, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. I love Titus 2, 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So as it relates to your salvation, what are, the, what are the great natural resources that God has given to you? What do you, how, what do you need to do work at these things? Work at growing in your faith. Work at, 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 at living in hope. Number three, work at showing love. Faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest, the Bible says, is charity. Jesus was asked during his earthly ministry, what's the great commandment in the law? Jesus didn't spend any time talking about, well, you know, the great commandment is make sure your head is, you know, cut in a certain way, your hair is cut in a certain way. The great commandment is make sure, make sure that you dress a certain way. That's not, that's not the great commandment. Uh, those, things, those things may have some merit. Those things may, you know, we, we may want to try to work hard towards, you know, identification and identifying ourselves as the people of God. But that's, that's not the great commandment. What's the great commandment the question is asked? Jesus gave the answer, didn't he? He said, the first and the great commandment is this, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. He said, that's the first and the great commandment. And then he said this, the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You know what he's saying there? He's saying that these, th this commandment to love, to love God and to love others, that the entire Bible rests on these two things. In other words, it is the foundation for all of God's word. You know, the world's a very hateful place, isn't it? But God's people, listen, saved people should be different. We should be filled with love for God and love for others. But you know as well as I do that that does not come naturally, does it? You're going to go to work tomorrow, and that coworker that kind of drives you crazy is going to be there. They're going to be waiting for you in the office. They're going to be waiting for you on the, on the floor of the plant where you work. And when you see them, you're going to think, ugh, another week of dealing with this guy or dealing with this gal. Some of you, it's even worse than that. Some of you come home every day and you're looking at your wife going, ugh, another week. And she's looking at you thinking the same thing. Now, I'm, again, I'm, I'm trying to be a little humorous here. I hope, that's, I hope that's not you and I hope that's not where you're at. But you, you get the idea, right? There are, there are certain people that get under our skin and we have a hard time loving them. Jesus, Jesus says the greatest commandment is loving God and loving others. You don't have to work at loving yourself. That comes very naturally to you, but you do have to work at loving other people. Sometimes even our own family. The love that should be the closest to us should be the most natural, and we've got to work at it a little bit. Jesus tells us in John 13, 35, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if ye have love one to another. In other words, we, we can let the whole world know that we're truly followers of Christ by the way that we love other people. So you need to, listen, you need to work at showing love. You need to work at living in hope. You need to work at growing in faith. And can I say that 
the, 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 these, things, we, these things are not natural to us. Therefore, therefore we need to understand how, how do we do these things? We, we, we understand, okay, what does it mean to work out your own salvation? I, I truly believe it means to grow in these areas, to, to unearth these beautiful natural resources. And as we conclude this morning, let me give you three, three principles of how you need to do this. And I think they're very clearly found back in Philippians 2. And let me just give them to you and we'll be done. Number one, number one, you need to steadily work at it. Steadily work at it. Look in verse number 12. He said, wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. You know, he understands the great struggle that all of us have, and that is to sort of blend into our surroundings. As Christians, we, we, can, we can look really godly and really spiritual on Sunday. And then we can go Monday through Saturday in the world, and we can sort of blend in there as well. To the point where, you know, the way that we looked on Sunday looks a lot different than what we're looking like and how we're talking and what we're saying on Thursday and Friday and Saturday. And he's saying this, he's saying, listen, don't, don't, just, don't just work at these things when I'm around. He said, I, I watched you, you were, you were living the life. But he says, guess what? Now that I'm gone, the, the, the pressure is even greater for you, to, for you to continue to abound in these areas. In other words, don't just, don't just live this kind of life when somebody's watching. Don't just live this life when you come into the church house or when the pastor's around or when the Sunday school teacher's around or when your parents are around. He's saying, he's saying in my absence, grow and develop in these areas. Be disciplined. Steadily work at it, consistently, at all times. Not just when you're around certain people. Number two, not just steadily work at it, but notice number two, seriously work at it. Look, he says at the end of verse number 12, he says, work out your own salvation, how? With fear and trembling. If you had on your person today $50,000 in cash, you'd probably be a little nervous, wouldn't you? And we're sitting in church. <laughs> Imagine if you went to Mark's or Giant Eagle or the library or whatever the case might be. I, I know, you're looking, you're thinking to yourself, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to have that kind of money around the church people. I know what they might be capable of, right? We'd be a little, we'd be a little hesitant. That's a lot of money. Don't, don't pull that out of your wallet. Don't start showing, showing people all the $100 bills you have. Can I, can I just tell you that, that you and I, listen, we have a much, we have a much more greater um, precious resource in our faith than $50,000. $50,000 is temporary. You'll spend that. You can lose that. You can have that stolen from you. But remember, remember what Paul wrote. He says, now abideth these three, faith, love, and hope. These, these three, they're, they're here to stay. He says, you and I, we ought to get up every day and we ought to understand, listen, there is an enemy that is lurking outside. That there's an, even an enemy within that is seeking to destroy me in these areas. The Bible identifies our, our enemy as, as, as threefold. It's the world, the things that are in this world. It's the flesh, it's my own flesh, that's the enemy within. And it's the devil who wants to get into my life and destroy my life. And he says, listen, what you need to do is you need to hold on to those things and you need to grow in these things and you need to work at these things with fear and trembling, understanding how precious and how valuable they are. Much more precious than silver and gold. Number three, submissively work at it. Verse number 13 says this, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You know where you need to start today? You need to start with this thought. I am incapable of doing any of these things in my own flesh. Here, here's, what, here's what I love about the Bible. Paul writes, Paul writes, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And then the very next verse he reminds us, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, if it's gonna happen, God's gonna have to do it anyways. In other words, it's never about me, it's always about him. But here's the element where it is about me. I have to surrender, I have to submit myself to him. That's the part that's about me. In other, words, in other words, if I'm gonna grow in faith, if I'm gonna live in hope, and if I'm gonna show love, God's gonna have to do it in my life. Because it's, it's, it's him that, that, that gives me the ability to do these things. Notice, notice two things, we'll finish. If I'm, gonna, if I'm gonna submissively work at it, here's what I have to understand. I have to understand that God is gonna have to give me the desire to do it. You know, you know naturally, I don't have the desire to read my Bible. I'd much rather watch television. Naturally, I, I don't have the desire to get down on my knees for 25, 30 minutes every morning and to pray and ask God for wisdom. I would much rather sit and eat a donut. And so would you. So, so would every one of us. That's the natural flesh. The natural flesh is craving for things that are easy, for things that are light. 
And so if you're ever gonna grow in your faith, you have to understand, listen, you gotta submit yourself to God because, because without that, you don't even have the desire to grow in your faith. You don't even have the want to do it. It is God that worketh in you both to will, to even have the desire to grow in faith, to, to live in hope, to show love. The Bible says in Psalm 119, 36, incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. You know what he's saying? He's saying, Lord, give me a love for your word because I really don't have it. I really don't have it in myself. My natural flesh doesn't really love God's word. So Lord, if you're gonna give me this, Lord, you're gonna have to incline my heart to these things. You're gonna have to turn my heart, create in me a new heart and renew a right spirit within me. Lastly, God not only gives us the desire to work at it, but he gives us the ability to work at it. It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. I remind you in the same book, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. 